From decades of research, I've concluded that the torus is, in fact, the fundamental pattern that the universe uses to evolve. It is the energy flow, and the vector equilibrium is the fundamental structure of space. My explorations with many scientists through the Sequoia Symposium, the University of Science and Philosophy, the Institute for the Study of Consciousness, and other venues has given me strong confirmation for these insights into primary patterning. Not only did the two patterns appear as primary from tiny molecules all the way to vast galaxies, but over time we began to see how the two patterns fit together as one. A 10-year study by a team of Italian astronomers confirmed our understanding that even at the level of galactic clustering, about as big as one can think in physical terms, the pattern of groupings matched the vector equilibrium, or isotropic vector matrix, outlined by Fuller. I worked with physicist, geometer, computer scientist Robert Gray to see if what we had learned would reveal a useful new understanding of the table of atomic elements, the 92 complex patterns by which spirit or consciousness manifests into what we call matter. We worked with the hypothesis that if the torus were fundamental, then it would probably be the shape of hydrogen, the fundamental atom. The next element, helium, would be a double torus, like the sun itself, and the rest would complexify from there as pressure was added to the tiny structure by the giant stars and supernova in which they are cooked. Bucky Fuller's cosmic octave hierarchy laid out a potentially predictable series of shapes with each electron as a torus on the outside and each proton as a torus in the nucleus, both connected by a tornado-like vortex of energy. Confirmation of our identifying this atomic structure came along the way from the work of Patrick Flanagan. The donuts were spinning in, in such a way that energy was exiting at the equator and energy was coming in through the poles, and the proton had the exact reverse. So now a neutron would be a combination of an electron and a proton coupled together. The cosmic octave hierarchy is to 3D geometry what the music octave is to sound waves or the rainbow is to light. It begins with the simplest space-containing form, the tetrahedron, and its dual. These two form the cube, whose dual is the octahedron. Next comes the icosahedron and its partner, the dodecahedron. And finally, the vector equilibrium and its dual, the rhombic dodecahedron. As with so much in nature, the sequence seems to follow the most efficient, least effort arrangements of symmetry in space. Increasing external pressure creates not billiard balls, but more and more of the whirlpools that show up as electrons on the outside and protons on the inside. As the structure of the atoms become more complex and get heavier, they periodically reach stability in what are called the inert, or noble elements, neon then argon, then krypton, xenon, and finally radon. Each of these is characterized by having eight electrons in the outer shell. And I believe these eight vortices match the eight outer triangles of the vector equilibrium. And that is why they exhibit equilibrium on their own. They are essentially satisfied or literally fulfilled and do not seek to combine with other atoms for stability. As each so-called shell builds toward equilibrium, the pressure creates more and more vortices inside the outer shell, and these form the geometries of the octave hierarchy. The atomic numbers of each inner shell hint that if we could look inside, we could see the sequential forming of the duotetrahedron, the octahedron, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron. The late master geometer Marvin Solid showed me how nature's phi spiral coordinates even atomic structure. 
And more recently, cosmometry explorer Marshall Lefferts has been modeling this dynamic. The final elements, like radon and uranium, have their outer vortices, or electrons, so far from the pull of the nucleus that they are on the verge of flying off to join other atoms. That seems to explain why they're so volatile and ready to radiate or start a chain reaction as used in the atomic bombs and nuclear fission. This is why Walter Russell had warned in his book Atomic Suicide that these elements should be left deep in the earth where they're naturally doing their job of dissolving rock rather than brought to the surface, where they represent the most lethal toxicity for humans and other species. I heard Bucky Fuller say, there's nothing wrong with nuclear power. It's just that the safe distance from the reactor, the sun, is about 93 million miles. Physicists have been spending billions in taxpayer money for decades trying unsuccessfully to access energy through attempting to fuse hydrogen atoms together at sunlight temperatures in their tokamak device. They're using the torus shape, but still use an approach of force rather than blending or resonance. At the new Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, they have constructed the largest ever man-made torus, 17 miles around, to reach energy levels that they hope would reveal the substructure of the atom and to find the hypothetical God particle, the Higgs boson, that is supposed to make the whole universe work. Yet once again, the fundamental idea is crashing protons together at high speed to create a powerful splash of energy. What if instead we were to take a more Aikido-type blending approach? to learn to follow the dance, to see what the universal energy flow naturally does, and then go with it instead of crashing against it. What if the fundamental building block of the universe is not a thing, a billiard ball type particle, but a geometry of flow, a pattern that holds true at any scale? What if instead of creating more violence to access our energy needs, we look to harmonic resonance, to the natural amplification that happens when waves are in sync, when two systems get in tune. To find out more about the proven applications of this notion, be sure and check out our New Energy Technology section of the website.